Uh, my name's Phil Callishaw. I'm head of uh, the Adobe Advertising Cloud for Australia and New Zealand. Firstly, thank you very much for joining us for the Advertising Cloud track this morning. Uh, we're really excited to be able to showcase some of the work that we're doing behind the scenes uh, as we continue to integrate and innovate the Adobe Advertising Cloud into the wider uh, Adobe Experience Cloud. Uh, and I'm also super excited to have two uh, of our clients join us on stage as well. So Gemma Anderson from Deakin University and Mark Dawson from Allianz Insurance will also be joining me on stage. What we wanted to do was start today uh, and really start and focus on what is the Adobe Advertising Cloud? Why have we built what have we built? What is the coming together of a number of acquisitions that take, have taken place over the years uh, in this space? and start to understand what does advertising at Adobe mean. So what we're going to be looking at is the convergence of ad tech and marketing tech, looking at how technology has evolved in the advertising space, and then really focusing on where does this intersect. We believe it intersects at advertising, at data, and at the creative level. So let's start thinking about this, advertising cross-channel orchestration. This is really, really important for us and something that we're truly focused on delivering as a business. <clears throat> and when you think about this and you start to think about uh, your partners and your technology uh, suppliers that you're working with, really focusing on the fact that advertising should not be a channel. Uh, sorry, advertising should be a channel. Advertising should not be an island. It should not be a last thought on your media schedule. It should not be... Uh, separated from the rest of your communication strategy. And that's really, really important for us to consider. And we'll take you through how you link uh, your advertising technology, the Adobe Advertising Cloud, to other areas of the Experience Cloud business to really be able to help you to create really compelling experiences for your customers and help them navigate the journey and their engagement with you as a brand. So let's have a look back at how advertising has evolved over the years. In the beginning, it was a lot simpler. There was one way to connect. You as an advertiser would connect directly through a publisher and you would, you would be able to reach those consumers. Then there were ad networks. Does everyone remember the ad networks? They came in. They aggregated inventory at scale. They created cost efficiencies so that as brands, you were able to reach uh, more and more people online uh, at incredibly uh, value-driven rates. We then started to see the ad exchanges come into the space. Now, the difference between an ad exchange and an ad network was an ad exchange put the advertiser back in control. You were valuing the impression. You were making a decision on how much you wanted to pay for that media. Then supply-side platforms came into the space. Businesses that were really focused on helping the supply side, the publishers, increase their yield from their advertising. And of course, we had demand side platforms like the, <clears throat> like the Adobe Advertising Cloud, who aligned 100% with advertisers, servicing only one side of the equation. How do we ensure that we're deliver delivering the best results for you, brands and agencies, and ensuring that we're reaching your audiences at scale. And now what we've seen is a fundamental shift. We're starting to see the conversation change from point solution technology providers and technology vendors to marketing stacks, really driving and taking over the conversation. So when you think about this, you think of the Adobe Experience Cloud, which the Adobe Advertising Cloud is a key component of trusted, transparent, uh, data and content marketing stack. And then you think about the other spaces, and when you think about and understand how all these different uh, technology stacks are, are coming together, it's all underpinned by data. Google marketing solutions, underpinned by their incredible strength in search uh, data. We see Facebook looking at interest-based data. And then as an organization, we also, we're starting to see this rise in Amazon marketing services. They're already making huge tractions in North America. Uh, and as everyone knows, recently launched Amazon.com into the Australian market 
marketplace, we see this, come, this trend continuing to happen. And their data is all driven by purchase level data. So we're starting to see four really key components, four key marketing facts starting to take the conversation over. And really, the challenge for you as marketers and you as agencies is how do you use these different technologies together to deliver the best results for your clients and the best outcomes for yourself. <clears throat> and what I think is really, really important is when you think about all of this and you think about uh, demand-side platforms, you think about bid management uh, tools uh, in, in the search space, you think about how you buy uh, social media, all of those things are programmatic. And when we think about programmatic, we really think about it in this way. Programmatic is not a channel. It's software. The same way that you think of your DMP uh, as software, your data management platform, the same way as you think of your on-site analytics, it's software. But it is technology that is helping to make your lives easier, to help you to be able to get into the data, understand exactly what is happening, what is taking place, how you can glean insights out of that, and then <clears throat> increasingly how you can take those data sets and activate on them in environments off your own assets. <clears throat> and when you think about what you can buy programmatically today, and this is really important because often we hear the word programmatic said, and people think about retargeting. They think about a race to the bottom of really, really incredibly low CPMs. The way that we think about it at Adobe is it transcends a number of different channels. It's software that helps you to execute your media campaigns. So the Adobe Advertising Cloud, search, display, video, connected television, uh, <clears throat> an area that we're seeing a huge fundamental shift in this marketplace of an absolute rise in the, in the need and the demand of on-demand uh, on content uh, as consumers shift from a time base to an on-demand choice and control environment, consuming access and media on their terms. And then, of course, social media as, as well. The ability to be able to attract new customers, to be able to retain your existing customers, to help you to alleviate churn, uh, and drive increase uh, share of wallet, and also to engage with them over a long time. And that's really, really important, is how you can do that. And looking at that in one software, in one console, to help you to really be able to reach your audiences at scale. <clears throat> and now the way that you do that is through data. So quick show of hands, which is always risky in these sort of situations. Who today is using a, demand, uh, a data management platform? OK, good size. I like it. Um, so it's really, really important. And when we think about this, you're starting to think about where advertising sits. And today, we fundamentally believe advertising still sits a little bit as an island, uh, disconnected from a lot of your other strategies. And the reason we think of this is <clears throat> there's truly a unique opportunity today to integrate your advertising channels. We have huge investment in CRM, in on-site personalization, in uh, optimization that takes place across your on owned and operated properties. No business today just sends out blanket emails to their customer base. It's all personalized, whether that's uh, simple things like your name <clears throat> or uh, your previous purchase behavior. And the reason that we do this is because we know that the response rate and the ROI of personalization in that environment drives better outcomes for both the consumer and also the business. So the real opportunity here is how do we link advertising to start to take many of the concepts that are done today in one-to-one -one messaging, in personal emails, in the experiences that you're delivering across your owned assets, how do you extend that to the bought world where you're activating audiences at scale? How do you ensure personalization and ensure that you're delivering that right message to these consumers. And so linking these all together, your advertising investment, your marketing, and your CRM is truly powerful. 
And that's truly how you are able to deliver really compelling experiences for consumers and to ensure that you're delivering uh, those right messages. You're not overexposing users. It's also important uh, when, you know, we, we often think about as soon as someone purchases our product and purchases with our brand, let's stop messaging them. How do you nurture them through? How do you ensure that they, you continue to engage with them? And, and just as simple and just as importantly, ensuring that once they've purchased with you, you don't start serving ads to that user with a better offer than they signed up for the next day. <clears throat> and so the way that we do this, the intersection of data at Adobe is Adobe Audience Manager, an advanced segmentation engine, a data marketplace where you can partner with different uh, publishers and different uh, data owners, uh, and then also Adobe Analytics, customer analytic, uh, analytics, attribution modeling, predictive analysis. And so what does this look like and how does this work across the different uh, technologies and the different clouds? So, Really, really important is the ad cloud that sits on there. And remember, when we think about the ad cloud, we're thinking about passing data within the search environment, within social, within display, within video. So today, as many of you know, there's real-time uh, syncs that take place between audience manager and analytics. When you think about that, you think about analytics being uh, the ability uh, and the the, the console to be able to tell you how, how are people engaging with your owned assets, what they're doing, the time that they're uh, willing to give you as a brand, uh, and then audience manager where you can start to overlay uh, data signals, the more human side of data. So who is doing it? What do those audiences look like? How are they engaging with you? <clears throat> you then pass those audiences into the ad cloud. And so many of you, I'm sure, are doing this with your DMP today. Uh, but what we're looking at is also the fact that it's a native audience. So the taxonomy that you create inside of your DMP passes directly into the advertising cloud, and it's the same taxonomy. And that sounds really, really simple and really, really obvious, but you'll be shocked at how many people we work with who have a taxonomy that's males 18 to 49, pass it into, into a DSP, and it's, it's called segment four. Or it's called something completely different. It's called auto intenders. So making sure that that sync is seamless, it's the same taxonomy, providing you with data governance because it's all within a secure environment. You're within the Adobe ecosystem, so you're not passing it to a third party. And why do we think this is really, really important? It's not only because the taxonomy is there, the data governance is there, it also means that we have higher match rates. And that's really important because you've spent uh, significant time and resource aggregating your data into your DMP, and then when you want to activate them, you lose a lot of those audiences today through what's called a match rate between different technologies. So this is a very quick example of a client who is live with us and what they did with match rates that were 5 to 10% higher. They saw a $96,000 uplift in acquisition ROI. <clears throat> that's based on a $14 uh, acquisition campaign. And that's really, really important because what we were able to do was reach more of those users who are high value to that business and convert them to customers. With a lower match rate, we would never have been able to find those users again. That brand would have built those data assets and not been able to actually reach them. The other thing that I think is really, really important that is often overlooked when you consider things like match rate is the ability to suppress, to suppress your existing customers from prospecting messages. The ability to be able to save that media investment and reinvest that into actually hitting your prospects. Absolutely critical for a business. So this brand was able to save $430,000 just by doing ad suppression. Absolutely powerful and absolutely critical <clears throat> to help them to continue to prove out the ROI in their media activation. So we have audiences syncing between audience manager, analytics. 
that data going into Audience Manager, then being passed to the Ad Cloud. <clears throat> what we are releasing in Q4, something that I'm really passionate about and really excited uh, to be able to do, is passing actionable log files back to Audience Manager. Now, what that means is you're able to then understand exactly who has been exposed to those audiences and pass it back up. And you can make decisions off of that data. Do you continue the journey? Do you start to suppress them and push them into a different pool? Do you retarget them with a different format? Do you push them to video? Do you push them to highly targeted dis display messaging? And then, of course, just as critical, Add cloud data into Adobe Analytics. <clears throat> Campaign classifications going from the ad cloud directly into your analytics, where you can use analytics workspaces to understand your media data. And then something that, uh, especially from my agency days, when we used to look at ad server data, and then you used to talk to a brand about the number of conversions, never quite aligned, is looking at Analytics data directly into the ad cloud, so using the same conversion infrastructure to optimize. So the, the impact that you are seeing inside of analytics is being optimized inside of the advertising cloud. And this is also super exciting for us because of the sparsity of data that is often used in advertising to be able to optimize. And the reason we think that is exciting is if you have a 3% conversion rate, <clears throat> and you're using uh, a, a, a tradi more traditional way of, of buying media, you have your impressions, you have your clicks, and then you have conversions. It's very hard to know what happened in the middle ground, and that's where you start to have to make decisions off of 3%. Sometimes it's higher, sometimes it's lower. That's, that's obviously <clears throat> a, uh, a, an average of what we see. So really critical is how do you get more data into your advertising platform to help the algorithms to make better decisions to be able to drive response. And so when you think about this, and going into this into a little bit more detail, the reporting of the data flows, starting to see what you would traditionally see inside of analytics, time spent, page views, bounce rates, unique visitors, the ability to be able to separate out people who have previously visited your website and completely net new to your site inside of your advertising. And then in your analytics, clicks, costs, impressions, how did that user actually end up on your web property? <clears throat> it's a question that I think we've all asked and, and we all really want to know uh, the ability to get this and we're starting to be able to build this in, inside of uh, the business as you link it to, to uh, the different assets within the experience cloud. <clears throat> and then starting to see that inside of your analytics platform. So deduped advertising data seamlessly in your workspace. Starting to look at things like hourly trends, product by keyword, and then being able to pull in multi-dimensions. We're really excited about the opportunity and the prospect that that is giving uh, advertisers to be able to really understand the impact of their ad investment and their, and their uh, data-driven advertising investment as we're linking on-site personalization with off-site personalization and understanding how are we engaging with your prospects and with your, with your consumers. And the reason that we're super passionate about this and, and we've, we understand this is we've seen results and what I want you to focus on here is not necessarily the 7 to 13% standalone ROI lift. That's what the ad cloud delivers when we're looking at impressions, clicks, and final conversions. What's really exciting is when you link different assets, you give the platform more data to be able to optimize against. You start to think about things like bounce, return visits, page views. You again see an incremental uplift in performance. And I'm super interested in the concept of how you use potentially bounce rate in your advertising campaigns. If it's a new customer or a new prospect who visits your site and they bounce after one page, today what we would do is you would retarget that user. 
you would spend at your investment trying to find that user again. By using this, you can understand, do you want to actually message people who bounce, who don't engage deeply in your content, and understand, is it worth reaching them again? Or do you, do you allow them uh, other channels and suppress those users? So starting to think about how do you, again, save uh, investment to be able to reallocate that. <clears throat> As we move forward, uh, you saw yesterday in the keynotes uh, the, the data platform that is underpinning uh, everything that we're doing. So as we're starting to roll out different attribution models to enable you to start to understand the impact that different channels are having uh, on top of your uh, campaigns. This is available today inside of the ad cloud for advertising data only. So looking at search, social, uh, display, video, pulling different models, helping to understand what is influencing, what is closing, what is the relationship that takes place between your display advertising and your search advertising. But we will start to increasingly see, again, inside of analytics, attribution IQ, building pathing data, and helping you to get deeper understanding and analysis of what is taking place across all of your channels including your own assets, to help you to understand what is that user journey? How does it change? And most importantly, how can you influence and create change in that user journey? Final thing I wanted to touch on was creative. Now, I hope you all saw uh, the creative demo yesterday in the keynote. We also have a session uh, dedicated to creative coming up in this room at 11 a.m., uh, which I'd love to see as many of you as possible in. But we believe this is really a critical missing piece in advertising today. And the reason for that is it is incredibly hard and time-consuming to be able to react to market changes, to be able to do mass personalization at scale. And so what we have built inside of the Adobe Advertising Cloud is linking creative to a demand-side act platform activation layer, going directly from creative cloud into the ad cloud. This is really important, and we're really, really excited about this, because all of your data segmentation that you're taking place in analytics and inside of Audience Manager, being able to then use that and reach them in, through the demand-side platform and through search to help you to be able to reach those audiences at scale, this now also ensures that you're able to deliver that right message to them as well. And so we will go into this in, in a lot more detail over the day, but it is a, a very new product that we've brought to market. We're really, really excited about it. Um, you will see MGM uh, case studies in the next session, potentially, if you want to talk about anything that has taken place. I'm, I'm of course, happy to uh, work with you, but the idea is, is how can you build really simple decision trees? How can you build a data-driven strategy uh, and visualize that? So not putting it into an Excel spreadsheet and trying to build a retargeting matrix. How can you build out that user journey? Linking audience manager segments directly into this space to help you to deliver those personalized messages. So when you start to think about those different components, advertising, linked by data, and then overlaid by ensuring that you're delivering that right creative message, we believe that as marketers, we can start to really ensure that advertising and ad tech is not an island. It's part of your marketing strategy. Advertising as a marketing channel. When we think about this, and, and my ask is start to think about how can we learn from the other areas that we are personalizing, starting to understand what is the ROI that has been achieved, and why shouldn't we do that in an advertising space as well? Ensure your DMP is connected uh, and being activated. We see DMPs used in all different ways. A lot of it is for on-site personalization, but how can we ensure that you activate that at scale? the ability to integrate into your analytics to increase your message. Measurement, sorry. And then finally, creative. 
really important to start to understand how can we change the creative workflow? How can we be, use dynamic templates to really help you to be able to deliver personal messages at scale and to ensure that those messages that we are delivering at scale are still really great experiences. They're on brand and they deliver uh, compelling uh, experiences. So thank you very much. I'd like to invite Mark Dawson on stage uh, from Allianz. Thanks, Mark. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Um, everyone's done pretty well to get here by 9 o'clock this morning after what uh, may have been a late night for many, but thank you for coming. Um, I'm going to talk through, back one slide, uh, our journey with the uh, Adobe Ad Cloud to date uh, and what we've sort of tested, what we've learned, and where we're sort of going with the wider Adobe, Adobe technology platforms. Um, so at Allianz, we made the decision to take all of our media in-house about two years ago uh, for a number of reasons. We wanted to develop strong relationships with the publishers we work with. Uh, we wanted direct relationships, deeper integration. We wanted to be across all the betas that various technology companies like Google and Facebook were launching and have some of those direct relationships. And also having media in-house gave us the ability to be uh, sort of faster response to market conditions and changes within our business. We also wanted a close relationship with uh, technology vendors, Google, tech, uh, Google, Adobe, et cetera, and to have those kind of direct relationships with their teams and their product engineering teams, et cetera, to understand what was happening and what we could better do. Uh, and also just to leverage group agreements within Allianz as well. And then lastly, um, allowing, having media in-house allowed us to uh, kind of develop better, uh, stronger relationships within the business ourselves, <clears throat> so deeper integration with different business units and what marketing we're doing and the media we're buying and how that impacted potentially pricing and technical teams, et cetera, and just to help remove silos and improve the kind of communication across the business in terms of what marketing was doing. So we, we began with Adobe about uh, 18 months ago, uh, first off with Adobe Ad Cloud, uh, and specifically bringing our paid search activity onto the platform. And we fairly quickly saw uh, an improvement in our paid search performance uh, across our various product lines. Um, we obviously use AdCloud to, to find users across multiple platforms, devices, et cetera. Uh, and with search, we, we've tested a number of different approaches to bidding, budgeting by product, by cost per quote, by geolocation, et cetera. We've sort of come to find the right solution and approach that works for us over that time. Um, and then pretty quickly, beyond just using AdCloud for paid search, we also started uh, using the platform to buy a connected TV inventory, and then more recently, audio, such as Spotify, etc. And now sort of getting to the point of understanding and, and better um, utilizing the platform to uh, advertise across different channels and connect up with the data in the back end of the platform to, to do a better job of optimization. Um, so more specifically around what we've done with paid search, so I said we... we initially saw an uplift of about 20% in our campaign performance. And then over the past year, we've sort of continued to see efficiency gains of 11% um, through sort of various optimization practices we've taken, tweaks to the platform in how we kind of weight uh, one product quote versus another, et cetera, to sort of try and get that next percent of efficiency improvement over time. Um, we've also taken different approaches to budgeting uh, and sort of looked at budgets by product, budgets by location, and now sort of looking at, okay, one budget across all products and optimize the platform to improve ROI overall, et cetera. Um, and then also the platform allows us just a, a great, de great degree of flexibility within our um, SEM activity as well. And also the ability to forecast out uh, at various levels of spend what our expected return will be. So we can go back to the business or the, the wider marketing team and say, if we invest X, we should get Y in terms of, of revenue back. And if we increase that spend, what will be the impact? And also allows us to understand, okay, if we, if we want to shift budgets across channels, what can we really do in search and what needs to come in or out of search to, to grow the business? Um, and as I mentioned, we, we've also been testing more around video and CTV within the platform. So prior to uh, the acquisition of Tube Mogul, we were speaking to the Tube guys. Um, we'd begun a bit of a pilot, and then we sort of learned that Tube was being acquired by Adobe, which was, was great for us because we were already using the platform. Um, and we've really done a few interesting things since then. One of the questions that came up within the business is, and as everyone knows, more and more people are shifting their TV, online, TV viewing habits online through connected TV devices, etc. And we know that um, those people that are watching connected TV during, say, peak TV hours probably aren't also watching the free-to-wear uh, broadcast. So there's a, a segment of people that we're no longer reaching on TV that we need to find where they are on, on connected TV devices. So one of the questions going into the, the trial and the use of AdCloud was, 
could we use our CTV spend uh, during peak TV hours to find people that we weren't reaching uh, by a free-to-air? And specifically around peak TV hours, uh, because we wanted to really sort of focus on a certain audience that we wanted to reach um, by free-to-air as well, rather than at other times of the day. And again, it just began as a bit of a test. Uh, and we found that there is a, a sizable number of people watching connected TV devices between the hours of 6 p.m. and midnight. And for the budget we had, we could really focus on reaching those people during those hours. And the graph there sort of shows a sort of a, a scale of um, uh, usage during the day of households using uh, either connected TV devices or viewing uh, TV on tablet, desktop, mobile, etc. We got significant scale that way and, and sort of also did a lot of testing around CPM by time of day, etc. to understand when was the most efficient time to buy that inventory. Was it 6 p.m., 10 p.m., 1 p.m., etc.? Um, another question we had going into the platform was what was the level of duplication of audience across device, uh, across different channels, etc.? And were we reaching the same people over and over again across just different stations? And were we potentially wasting budget and could be optimizing and spending elsewhere? Um, so working with the Adobe team, we ran a, a test over a few months earlier this year to understand what that level of duplication by device and by channel was. And we found that by device and by sort of station, so 9, 10, 7, SPS, et cetera, the level of duplication was actually pretty low. It was about kind of 20%. Um, on average overall, and you can see by those white squares, uh, the conclusion for us being that the money we were investing was, was being spent wisely to reach incremental audiences and unique users. We weren't finding the same people over and over again on seven that we were on nine, etc. We also ran a bit of a test, uh, I think it was across The Bachelor or The Bachelorette, the show was on earlier in the year, um, where traditionally we may look at TV buying against specific shows, uh, whereas online we were chasing specific audiences, not so much what show they were watching. And so we ran a test where we bought um, inventory against a specific show to see what the level of duplication was on that show versus other audiences, and we found it was actually quite high. It was about 55% duplication. So it sort of told us that, okay, in future, let's just focus on audience wherever they're watching connected TV or video, rather than specifically what show they were watching. And it was just a different approach to, uh, to how we may look at offline versus online on video buying. And so sort of talking through what the ideal state for us is as we kind of continue with the journey with Adobe and, and where we're going. Uh, we began using Audience Manager about six, seven months ago now uh, with the initial sort of business case, as, as Phil mentioned, around audience suppression uh, and just not uh, targeting the people that we know have already bought a policy with us or have got a quote, et cetera, in, in different use cases. So with the... Um, We've sort of, we're using Audience Manager at the moment. We're looking at a few other Adobe products and sort of forming a vision of how we want this to all roll out and how we want to, to optimize the platform from a marketing point of view. So at the moment, we have on our .com.au site um, a lot of website user behavior. So you may go to the site and get a quote for a Toyota. And you'll tell us a few different details around um, your driving history, the car you own, the year it was made, et cetera. Uh, all data that's really useful for us in terms of being able to give you a quote, obviously, for a, a car insurance product, but also really useful data for our pricing and, and technical team to better, under, better understand the market and, and what's changing, et cetera. So we, we have a use case where we take that, that user data, we put it into Audience Manager, uh, and we have different segments around our car, make, model, age, location, et cetera. And we then push that data into AdCloud to find specific audiences across multiple platforms. So for example, the business may say, um, we want to find more users, sorry, more Toyota owners or more Mazda owners. And we can use some of our data to find those people online and, and target those. Or hypothetically, we, the business may say, look, we don't want more Tesla drivers, the, the cars are really expensive to insure, et cetera. So we can suppress what we know about users of, of what the car they have, et cetera. And we can use the iCloud to find those people across different devices, so obviously desktop, mobile, tablet, audio, et cetera. Um, where we sort of want to get to next is then to integrate all that data back into analytics through some of the features that Phil was talking about before, of having that, that data pass back and forth between Ad Cloud, Audience Manager, Analytics, to sort of see the next percent improvement, next five, ten percent improvement in our data, and be, uh, use that, that, those insights more intelligently. Um, and then there's also other business data that we have that we're now looking to put into the DMP as well. Things like Nespex, Nespex product, and what we know about existing customers, what channel they came in from, 
um, how long they've been a customer with Allianz, et cetera, to start really building out our, our targeting, our communication on a more kind of personalized basis. Um, and then also uh, talking to third party vendors about what data they may have and other publishers that we can augment and push into our DMP to do a better job of our targeting, et cetera. And so for us, the, the journey with Adobe is also uh, changing the way we communicate and talk and, and function as a business internally. And it's getting more and more teams involved in, in working with marketing to help make those decisions. So as an example, we're, we're talking more, I think, than we have had before with the technical and pricing teams around what data marketing can help give them and feedback in terms of who they might be wanting as a, 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 a new customer, which markets they want to push into, which locations, et cetera and identifying sort of high and low risk audiences and uh, augmenting the pricing data we have. Uh, we work closely with the customer analytics team looking at propensity modeling and next best action uh, and looking at cities and regions that we want more or less of you know, to grow. Um, and also into the claims team around high, low cost areas to, uh, of claims. And then also with the wider marketing team around creative opportunities. So using that data where we can look at uh, different audiences to work with creative to say, what variations of our creative can we use to target um, different audiences by age, location, car make, model, et cetera, that we know of? Uh, and also using uh, Adobe Target on our roadmap to sort of uh, implement that activity. And so for us, the next steps for, for our digital uh, transformation journey are really around how can we better leverage our data within the business, as well as second and third party data to take our, our, our digital marketing activity and optimization to the next step? Um, where can we improve our, our conversion and communication process across all of our digital assets? So ensuring that customers have great experiences across desktop, mobile, tablet, and that where possible we can sync up those experiences. Um, and then how do we use the combination of all the Adobe platforms to, to grow our business from the core? So, We've sort of been on a journey where we're using one plus one plus one Adobe platforms. How do we kind of combine them all together? And I guess um, you know, realize the dream of all that data kind of flying uh, seamlessly back and forth. Um, but also to do a better job of taking all the data we know about existing customers to kind of incrementally grow our business um, and, and continue growing from there. Um, so that's been our journey with Adobe to date. Uh, I'll hand back to Phil. Uh, Go from there. Thank you very much, Mark. You have to stay on stage. I have to stay? Yeah, okay. you've got to stay. Sure. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you. Thanks very much, Mark. Uh, Long-term Adobe customer. Yeah. Uh, why did you start with search? Um, we began with so search. I guess my background's in search, so I've known the, the platform and, and how it works for quite a while. Um, search was one of the, for me, the easiest channels to prove out a, a use case pretty quickly. It didn't require a lot of implementation from IT, so we can get tags on the site pretty quickly. Um, and I knew that, just from past experience, if we could show a 5%, 10% uplift using the Adobe platform for search, that it helps create a business case for using other platforms as well and tying that data together. Perfect. Yeah. And I love the fact that, so you're using the search platform. Yep. Obviously, you've got a history, long history with that, that piece of software. Uh, but then when you started to look at the next channel to go into, yep. Uh, as you mentioned, you had a relationship with uh, Mogul pre-acquisition, um, which is now obviously the DSP for Adobe Advertising Cloud. What was the next channel that you started to think about, and why did you do that? The next channel for us was um, definitely connected TV. I think, um, in one sense, shiny new toy. It was, it was definitely a, a growing area. Um, and even personally, sort of watching more connected TV, thinking, OK, I want to see our ads on those, those platforms when I'm watching. Um, and also just, I think, from a search background where it's all about cost per clicks, conversion rates, you've got endless Excel data to kind of work with, it was fascinating seeing TV moving into that area where the media was becoming more biddable. Um, you can increase, decrease bids and see you know, how that impacts uh, how much inventory you're getting. So for me, it was a, a natural progression of taking numbers and the, and the metrics you're used to with search and applying that to a traditional kind of TV world. So it was really interesting. Yeah. And really fascinating insights where... We, you looked at the CPMs, yeah. uh, and you know, actually primetime CTV was coming out cheaper than daytime yeah. connected television, yeah. which I think was quite surprising for us all, let's yeah. be honest. That's good. Um, and then what do you, like, so what's next? So you've started to work and integrate audience manager, yeah. uh, activating audiences inside of the DSP, yeah. um, any partnerships? 
So we're talking to a lot of um, uh, directly with publishers in the yep. market too around what data they have. Um, specifically, sort of like like seven, nine, ten, etc. All have interesting data strategies there, and then also other third data, uh, third party data providers around um, the, the kind of data we're interested in is if you've recently bought or sold a home, home maybe, or you're moving, then your next probably product you're going to look at is is insurance, or if you've just bought uh, a new car you're going to have to insure it. So we, we kind of really want to find those people in market who are, who are doing and buying products that we know are likely to involve an insurance product pretty soon. So um, really getting a handle on what data third-party providers have, how they get that data, uh, and how we can sort of work with them and leveraging it in a, a sort of a safe and um, private environment. Fantastic. And the idea is really how do you make the greatest impact with your advertising spend and yeah, exactly. reduce the wastage? If you haven't recently purchased a car, why uh, advertise and give them car insurance? Exactly, and there's a balance between uh, our marketing spend that's focused on cost per acquisition versus yep. brand building. So for, I guess from my point of view, um, digital is often seen as a, a cost per or a direct response uh, mechanism, and we know that people, you know, one twelfth of the population are in interested in insurance any time of the year, if you sort of think everyone roughly um, takes that insurance evenly through the year, so we know that Certainly from a, a display perspective, maybe a search perspective, that we don't want to be talking to everyone all the time. We just want to try and find those people who are in market in the next six weeks for insurance. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, Mark. Thanks, Paul. I would like to invite Gemma Anderson up uh, to stage now from Deakin University. Hi, everyone. So my goal today is to give you a bit of an insight into how we've been activating a lot of this technology at Deakin. So taking a lot of that theory of data-driven advertising into real-world applications. I'm going to cover three key themes roughly today, and I'm mainly going to be focusing on providing as many examples as possible because I know that that's what people love to hear. Um, so as a little bit of a background on education to set that concept, um, context is that we have very distinctive audience segments. What I need to say in order to inform and inspire a high school student um, is very, very different to how I need to talk to someone who's interested in a postgraduate degree. Um, in this... We also have over 200 products, and someone is only ever going to buy one course from us at a time, and they're also only looking at a very limited um, consideration set of products. I can't cross-sell a grad diploma of virtual reality to someone who's interested in an MBA. And in the same vein, there's no point in talking about our state-of-the-art on-campus facilities to someone who's based in Queensland and interested in studying with us online. Time and time again, we find we are more effective when we're able to deliver targeted and personalised communication. And our challenge is not what we need to say in order to be effective, but identifying who we're actually speaking to at that moment in time. And our problem is that when channels sit in silos, we often will only ever see a mere shadow of who someone is. And sometimes all of that information is actually there. It's just not connected together. Um, so this is a common scenario for us. So say we've got someone who's interested in studying an MBA. Let's call her Kerry. She goes to our website. She starts looking at our course detail page for a Master of Business Administration. She becomes a little bit overwhelmed by all of the information and realises that she wants to talk to someone about her options. So she sees a call to action saying, hey, give us a call, and does so. While she's on the phone, our friendly sales team will take her details and explain to her that in order to study an MBA, you need to have already had a bachelor's degree and about three to five years management experience. So they end up having a really constructive conversation about starting a Bachelor of Property and Real Estate, and Kerry gets off the phone really excited. So two things happen next. Firstly, um, last page retargeting kicks in. So Kerry starts to see social media and display advertising spruiking our MBA product, which she's not actually eligible for. Secondly, she's been added to our database as an undergraduate prospect, and she drops into a nurture track of emails promoting undergraduate study and personalised towards property and real estate. So one of these channels is delivering the correct contextual messaging. The other is not. The left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. And look, this advertising is still doing a job. It's making sure that Deacon is top of mind, but she's not going to click on it. It's not for a course that she's eligible for or, or, and no longer interested in. It's me media wastage. And when we actually do the report and the ad, it's going to make the click-through rate look a lot lower than it actually should be. So it's going to make it unfairly look like it's not resonating what it actually is. Thing is, we can and should do better. Those two pieces of information should be collected. And this data disconnect shouldn't be happening. 
So the biggest shift for us in our advertising has been in the introduction of a DMP, which is enabling us to break down those data silos and activate using those signals that our audience is actually already giving us. So let's look at this in practice. Open day is a really significant moment in our marketing calendar. And this is the first year we've had the opportunity to activate a data-led audience strategy for this particular program. And what's been really exciting has been watching the sophistication of our advertising increase across so many different tactical pockets because of that better access to more robust data. So why is Open Day important? Open Days have a considerable impact upon the university preferences of high school students. For Deakin in particular, we know that we win at Open Day. If they turn up, they love us, they preference us. We just need to get them there in the first place and make sure they actually make the most out of the day. And if anyone has tried to get a teenager to do anything recently, they'll understand that that's not that easy. We also have the additional challenge of having three different open days for four different campuses across three different dates, and each of them have different event schedules. And we need to be reminding people about the open day that's relevant to them because they're only ever looking at attending one, maybe two tops. So retargeting is a really critical part of our program and has a number of different stages which ultimately ladder up to two primary goals. One, we want to get them back to the site and interacting with the relevant day planner for that campus because it shows more intent to attend and also means they're more likely to have a, a good experience on the day. But secondly, we need to remind them that Open Day is actually on that particular weekend so that they'll actually turn up. So historically, our retargeting strategy has been limited in that we've needed a site visitor to actually visit the relevant campus page in order to actually serve them that campus-specific advertising. But unfortunately, we've got this large audience who has only gone as far as the home page and then bounced or exited. So we can only serve them generic open day messaging in the hope that we'll get them back to the site and that this time they'll go a page deeper so we can put them into those journeys. Because we don't know what campus they're interested in or maybe we actually did all along. So traditionally, we've been very reliant upon them actually going to that web page, but by actually bringing in other traits, um, we're less reliant upon that behavior because for a lot of these people, they're actually already a lead in the database and have already told us which campus they're interested in or have actually already interacted with campus pages on different parts of our website. So by actually bringing that in and bringing that into one place, we're less reliant upon that primary behaviour and we're able to serve contextual advertising to a larger audience pool. And for our display, um, display re-advertising, the reason this is really important is that the click-through rate for campus-specific retargeting is more than double that of the generic advertising. So the more people we can reach with the more targeted communications, the better the result for us. Thing is, if we know that campus-specific advertising is more effective, why wouldn't this flow through to the rest of our channels? If we're delivering a certain standard of personalization off-site, we should be doing the same on-site, because at the end of the day, it's still the same experience to the user. So through using the same audience segments that we're using for retargeting, we're able to put in place a similar decision tree and able to serve on-site um, personalized homepage banners based upon their behavior. And these personalized banners are very effective at returning prospects to the open day site, with conversion rates varying between 5 to 30% versus non-personalized banners, which have conversion rates of around the 1% mark. Our data-driven advertising efforts aren't just about getting someone to open day. It also opens a door for better media attribution. So most events like today have very controlled entry and exit points, and everyone here has a lanyard which means if you're looking at uh, media attribution, it's fairly easy to see who actually turned up, who scanned into um, different sessions and start to hook that back from an attribution perspective. For university campuses, we've got so many different entry and exit points that if we had to start having everyone have a lanyard, it would make it very, very difficult um, for us to actually monitor that, but also would likely start to um, impact the experience. So we have to be a little bit more creative when we're looking for opportunities for attribution. So this year, what we're doing to make considerable strides forward in this effort is using geolocation technology to identify how many people have actually seen our mobile advertising, connect that to a device, and then identifying if that device actually turns up to our open day and which campus they've attended, and if they've turned up to any of our competitors' open days as well, which helps us with an attribution and also helps us with our retargeting journeys as well. The thing is, these are only a small snapshot of some of the programs we've been putting in place to optimise this open day program based upon the robust data that's available to us. 
thing is enhancements to advertising can't be made in isolation from the rest of the experience. Communications are more effective when they're single-minded and when you've got each channel shouting different messages with different competing calls to action and optimising towards different goals, all an audience sees is noise when all these touch points should be working together to move an audience through to a same unified end goal. Where we have gotten our strongest uplifts have been through cross-journey experiences that bring together media, on-site and email, activating the same audience with the same goal. It's the Captain Planet approach. With their powers combined, they can sell more product. Yay! So our channel specialists love new technology and with this tech stack in place, what we're at risk of is them going off and separate discipline teams doing their own optimizations without taking a channel agnostic audience first viewpoint. So what we're very clear about with our rollout was that our goal was not deep channel specific personalization, but cross channel journeys, which would often bring together four different teams to activate a single use case. One of our hero use cases for cross-channel experiences was our unfinished application strategy, which is the education equivalent of an abandoned cart strategy. Our goal here was super simple. Increase the conversion rate from application start to finish by serving more contextually relevant messages. Our current state was that our communications were saying, apply now, which wasn't wrong, but we thought it'd be more impactful if we actually said, finish your application, because that is actually the next action. So traditionally, how we would have approached this was, would have been just to update our retargeting so that the call to action was more relevant, which absolutely should have resulted in some level of an uplift. However, our approach in this instance was to test an experience that included homepage banners, paid search site extensions, and retargeting as an MVP, as a test. What we were able to conservatively attribute to this experience was an additional 107 applications. Now, for some brands in the room, that volume might not seem too impressive, but you've got to remember that education is a low volume, high value category. So 107 applications by the time you take into account offer an acceptance rate, whether it's undergrad or postgrad, puts us in the wheelhouse of additional 700,000 to $1.2 million in additional revenue. And this was run as a test during a smaller intake. With cross-channel experiences, our communications become so much more focused. We are clear on what the next action is, and all of our channels are working collectively to achieve that goal. A person won't be able to touch any of our assets without seeing the same message, finish your application. To make this happen, you need teams coming together and agreeing on what the priority is, which can be challenging if you've got different product ma uh, managers with different competing KPIs. And the thing is, sometimes it can't be a single message. Sometimes you do need to cycle through different products and different creative. We sometimes do that when we're unclear as to which course someone's interested in and they're in the earlier stage of the um, funnel. But we do so intentionally and we do so by design. Because if everyone's fighting to achieve different KPIs, you're going to reduce the effectiveness of everyone's programs of work and everyone's channels. A common channel, um, challenge for anyone embarking on this journey is determining how they're actually going to prove the value of investing not only the budget, but also the effort of introducing this technology into their advertising. This is really not as complex as people expect it to be and really comes down to a couple of factors. In, in our instance, we believe the priority ones is what is the culture of measurement within your company and how well you actually paid attention during primary school science class. So with the unfinished application strategy, when we put this together, we were extremely confident that this was going to smash it. So we were tempted to just put it straight to live, but we chose not to. This was run as an A-B test, which meant that only 50% of those who actually met the criteria were served this experience. And we waited until it hit statistical significance before rolling it out. So this roller coaster here is the day-by-day -day account of whether the control or the variant was winning. And that spike right there, that, is, that has such a potential to skew the results because it's the power of a deadline. The reality is the bulk of university applications are submitted in the last few days before the deadline. So any new activity we put to market in those couple of days or those few weeks can easily be attributed for conversions that they did absolutely nothing to influence. False positives and false negatives can hurt your business. Highly effective work can be dismissed because maybe the company collectively had a bad quarter because of heightened competitor activity. Um, sometimes a poor performing experience can be overvalued because it's launched at a time where seasonality is going to work in its favour. 
As an industry, we cop a lot of slack um, for being too subjective with our work. Fact is, we've got the tools at our fingertips to bring in objectivity, but you just need to show discipline in order to achieve that. I'm an extremely critical person, as my team is subject to know. <laughs> um, so when I'm presented with results, one of my first questions is always, what was your method, what was your sources? Because there tends to be two ways that people present conclusions, based upon their observations, which tend to have a lot of assumptions baked into them, or actually based upon a properly structured experiment. And guess which one has a bit more credibility? Academics are a key stakeholder at a university, and the vast majority of academics work in research, and there's a lot we can learn from them. Because within their field, rigour and removing bias from their research receives a huge amount of focus. And the principles that they use, the scientific method, hasn't changed since we all sat in Year 7 science class. Because the principles of that is encouraging people to figure out how they're going to measure the results before they start, not when they're in the middle of doing the post-campaign report and everything's already finished. Remember this? They actually teach us in Year 7. This is from a Year 7 textbook. And it's very simple and very clear to follow. Establish the hypothesis. What are you actually trying to test? What are you actually trying to prove? Being clear about this up front helps you critique your setup to make sure that there's, you don't, aren't introducing any outside influences that could change the results, that you don't have too many variables floating around. And that's actually also a really key point, is setting up an experiment with a control and a variable, because that just enables you to compare and report on the results. It's fairly simple. Because without a control and a variable, you start to... It just becomes a little bit more confusing from a reporting perspective. And look, there are absolutely instances where you could put something straight to production and then just compare its results compared to the last week or the last month or the last year. But you're making a huge leap in logic that there's no other factors that would actually influence the results of that. Sometimes you need to slow down to speed up, and patience and restraints is needed to make sure you've got the solid evidence that what you've actually delivered is effective. And taking the time to design optimizations as experiments also gives you the opportunity to examine it more closely and identify instances where perhaps the experience wasn't as impactful. Maybe it didn't work as well on mobile as it did on desktop. And this is the type of analysis you might not actually take the time to do unless you get into that rhythm and that habit of testing. Showing restraining cases is really important to ensure that you can actually quantify the return on investment of the technology the business is going to need in order to deliver on these experiences. Particularly if you're early in your journey and you're developing those use cases that you want to present to the business to demonstrate that return on effort, think about what you need to do up front to be confident that you can quantify the impact and build it into the configuration. It's almost so much faster and easier from a reporting perspective if you can dip into a dashboard and just see the results of A versus B. So much more simpler. I recently had a very frustrating moment where we actually tried to test the effectiveness of using animated creative versus static. But the problem was at the same time, we also completely changed our media strategy from affinity-based and interest-based to more targeted look-alike audiences. And because we didn't leave a static control in there and we changed too many variables, when we came to report upon its impact, we couldn't confidently identify if it actually made an impact on anything. Very frustrating, but something we probably could have identified earlier as part of the actual campaign design. So we don't get it right 100% of the time, but we do pride ourselves on having a culture of measurement. And the way to do this is often by the behaviours at every level in the organisation. Always distrust placements in a prime position to win. Did the media actually drive those outcomes, or did we just tag people who are going to convert anyway? Let a test run its course. I make it a priority never to um, interfere with something until it's actually hit that state of confidence and statistical significance. In my experience, it tends to be the senior stakeholders who get super excited about initial results and go, this is fantastic, just put it live. But the fact is, not every test actually wins, and sometimes you get an initial false positive. Don't be that person. But also, if you know there's a culture or risk of that within your organisation, don't share initial results. Say you don't know, pretend you don't know how to work the dashboard, and then show it at the end. Know thy source. Always ask someone how they got to the numbers they did. I have seen so much super high confident analysis completely fall apart when I've asked questions about the measurement method. And the more people who ask this question at every level, the less likely people are to try to compare apples to oranges and try to pass it off as a fair comparison. 
look for the evidence of the failure points, not success. People seem to act like a the job of a report is to talk about how great everything is because people don't like to deliver bad news, so they'll often avoid it. I'm so much more eager to hear what isn't working because that's the next thing on my roadmap. That's the next priority. Don't measure what's easy, measure what's important. Business metrics over media metrics every single day of the week. Yes, there are challenges. No, it's not easy, but it's the only way to start to get proper clarity, and you've got to chip away and work at it. Because data is useless unless it's trusted. Without credible data and credible analysis, you're just another person with an opinion. At the end of the day, technology is enabler of strategy. It's not the strategy itself. This isn't an arms race where the brand with the most technology wins. It's about how you use it. This tech stack can do some pretty sexy stuff, but unless you've got the right people taking advantage of it and a clear strategy for them to work toward, towards, it goes underutilized. If your data is disconnected and stuck in silos, then your advertising will always be less effective because it leaves you open to advertising to people who've already purchased, promoting the wrong product, and mis misclassifying people into the wrong segment. And media shouldn't be optimized without consideration of the full journey. It's not the only touch point at play. And yes, it is more difficult to get multiple channel owners working together on a single journey, but that's where the big wins are. And that's also the work that's harder for your competitors to replicate. And finally, you can't measure what, you can't manage what you're not measuring properly. If you're in the business of data-led marketing or advertising, then be data-led and do it with principle and rigor. Otherwise, what's the point? Thank you. Thanks very much, Gemma. Great presentation. <laughs> um, so thank you so much. Love the work that you've done, the integrations that you, you've started to do. You went all in yes, with Adobe. Yes, I did. Drank the Kool-Aid. That was a big effort, <laughs> so congratulations on getting to where you've got to. Um, I want to start with, like, where, where did you start your journey? Mm -hmm. You took it in-house. Yes. Uh, and then what was the initial investment? How did you, you build mm -hmm. a case to, to continue to grow your team to a team of eight now, I think? Yeah, so on media, we've got a dedicated team of five, and then we've got another two to three people at any point in time who are also working on media from an analysis, building audiences and things like that. But I think where we started initially was that we started off by taking our programmatic in-house. So what the trigger point for us was that it was about three or four years ago now, um, programmatic was just becoming something that our media agency was putting in as part of our plans, and it wasn't working. And we were sitting back going, well, is programmatic just hype or is it the way that it's being purchased and is it the technology that we're being told to use? So we tried it ourselves. We created a direct relationship with a technology provider, a programmatic pla um, partner, and our results were amazing. We absolutely smashed it and it gave us the confidence that we could do this ourselves because we know our business, we can have people who are just concentrated on doing this ourselves. So we just slowly started to bring more channels in-house and as you're bringing those channels in-house, you start to look at well, what is the actual technology underneath and how can we make this um, you know, more smart and more intelligent, start to solve some of the problems that are highlighted um, before around how we're controlling that data and making sure that we're talking to the right person at the right time. So that's where we started to realise that we had a need for a DMP. And as we sort of started to have those conversations, we could see the opportunities in making sure that uh, we had Adobe Analytics in there as well, that we had um, AdCloud there to actually activate against it and eventually uh, made that move towards Target as well so we could activate against those audience segments from personalization, also A-B testing as well. Fantastic. And that all sits in your team? Yes, it does. Yes, amazing. And then we've been talking the last couple of days. Mm -hmm. What's next? I mean, we, we're talking a lot about creative and personalization. Mm -hmm. You mentioned, you know, mm -hmm. all the campuses and the o different open days and the fact that really targeted, personalized... Ad copy it is driving huge results for Deakin University. So what's next on the, uh, on the roadmap for the team? The next thing is really just trying to increase that velocity <coughs> around the activation of use cases, but also getting that velocity around creative production as well. So we do a lot of A-B testing. We do a lot of personalization. No matter how much we do, I'd love to do you know, times it by five in terms of how many tests we're getting to market at any one point. It's just a case of, you know, velocity and trying to find ways to be, you know, increase that velocity, increase that agility, but also increase the impact of what we're doing. So we've now got within our team um, a dedicated designer and dedicated copywriter. We've always had copywriters within our business, but actually having a team sitting within our performance team itself, able connecting them better to 
the media team um, and looking at landing page copy, et cetera. It's just kind yep. of helping us to move things along yep. a lot faster. And a big thing I think for us mm. as well is the um, creative platform as well. So we're moving everything on to the new Adobe product um, for that dynamic creative builder, which is going to be a big project for the team, mm -hmm. um, but it's something that we're extremely excited about as well. Fantastic. So again, bringing more of those on-site personalizations mm. that you've been doing in Target into your creative messaging. Yes, as well drive. as making sure there's that connection with the media as well. Yes. Because as we keep saying is that it's about the cross, um, cross journey as much as possible and it can't be siloed. Yep, fantastic. Thanks, right. Gemma. No worries, thank you. <clears throat>